mean, I think it's a really common immigrant kid experience, right? Like, I knew at home that I was Indian. I saw the food that was on my table every day that my mom would cook, and that was undoubtedly Indian. But then I would go to school, and there were basically no people that looked like me. I never had any Indian friends. In terms of that cultural aspect, I really didn't feel like I belonged. Listening to the Taste Podcast. I'm editor in chief Matt Rodbard here with senior editor Anna Hazel. Today on the show, Matt catches up with Sama Dada, a cookbook author, TV personality, and the home cook behind Dada Eats, an incredibly popular Instagram account that draws from Sama's Indian heritage and is inspired by the food of London, California, and New York. Matt, what did you guys talk about? Anna, I met Sama a few years back after one of our live events at Books Are Magic, and I was just struck by how cool and incredibly smart she was. She told me about this book she was working on, and lo and behold, that book is now Dada Eats, Love to Cook It. It's just really great, and we talk about the recipes in the book, including chocolate chip, cookie pie, and the best doll ever, which is really fighting words, but she backs it up. We also talk about her highly seasoned take on plant-based cooking. Plant-based, but I noticed in the book she doesn't really use terms like vegan. Correct. Her vibe is not about about labels. It's really just cooking without meat and dairy and, and letting it fly. And these recipes are really creative and adventurous. We also talk about the challenge of baking with avocado. I was skeptical. She is certainly not. And her time working on the Today Show which has led to her exciting career in television. It's a really great story. Here's Matt speaking with Sama. Sama Dada, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Thank you, Matt. I'm so happy to be here. It's fun having you in the studio and and seeing your your smiling face. Aw, well, thank you. You know, I just told you this, but this is my first IRL (laughs) podcast, and I am honored. Wow. Wow. Well, we are IRL through some plexiglass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For safety's sake. Exactly. And I'm, I hope the IRL version is is more something than the than the Zoom version. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out at the end what it was. Yeah, you know, there's so much that gets lost via a Zoom screen, you know? So I love yeah. this for me. <laughs> it's really nice to, to see you. And, and Dada Eats has been this, um, this book that has exploded on the scene. Oh. And you have, I met you at a book reading a couple years ago at Books Are Magic, and you you were so cool and introduced yourself, and I was like, so nice to meet you. We were talking about your book, and all of a sudden, it's like you've got several thousand, no, hundreds of thousands of Instagram (laughs) followers, and you are a big star in the making. How did Dada Eats come about exactly? Well, thank you. That's really generous. Um, Dada Eats came about as a complete accident. Um, I was actually spending some time interning at CNN in New York for a summer. I knew I wanted to work in television, in broadcast TV, but not really in what capacity. And I just was taken by the food scene in New York. I always knew I wanted to live here and move here. But like, all I wanted to do was eat. And so by default, my entire camera roll was just inundated by like photos of food. I was like, what What are you going to do with this? So I'm like, I needed to clear it out. So naturally, I decided to put it on Instagram. Um, and what started as like a hobby of just taking photos of food and developing recipes kind of turned into this career, which I really didn't even plan. And then you end up at the Today Show. Yes. And you're a page, and then you work your way up to production associate. And then eventually, you're on the air with Al and the crew, and you're demoing, and you're you're young, you're ambitious. What was that like the first time you were on air on the Today Show? Like, probably the most wild out-of-body <laughs> experience I've ever had, because I, like, like you said, I was a page, uh, I had an assignment at the Today Show, I knew them, I knew the team, um, but in the sense of like running scripts to them and, and working in the control room behind the scenes as a production assistant, and it was very much a, like, you're really in it, you're in the production aspect of everything, and of course, I was building my blog on this side, but yeah. there was just no world in which I thought that that would ever be a possibility for me. And I I was on set when Dookie did a did a segment with the Today Show back in 16 for Koreatown. And I'm just in the studio and I'm so nervous just watching. So when I when I see folks go on the on the Today Show, not all television, but the Today Show, I am like it is it is such a a gauntlet that you but but tell me how many segments you ended up doing and what were some of the recipes that connected with viewers that got you to where you are today? 
Yeah, I mean, so basically I was a PA. The producer saw my blog and were, just literally asked me to be a guest on the show. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> like, you know what you're doing? Um, no, but I mean, I, I was working so hard both, you know, in studio and outside and 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 kind of when I got that first segment it just felt like you said like it's a lot of pressure but there's so much adrenaline and really the entire process it's so exciting and I did one and then I think I did like six within the first year Um, and it it got to a point where it it kind of made sense for me to take my role at today into more of a food capacity rather than just the PA capacity. So great And, and so let's talk about the way that you cook because in the book and also on your TV segments and, and in your on your website, you are doing a plant-based diet. Mm-hmm. And, and then really, you don't use terms like vegan, you don't use terms like gluten-free, but it is a plant-based diet. So where do you, how did you land on this? Because I, I think you've got, in reading your book, you've got a really holistic way of looking at cooking and diet and it doesn't really have a lot of labels thank you I really appreciate that and you know it's funny I think that as well as you know this being my career was sort of an accident as well I when I was at Berkeley I got really interested in health and in kind of what I was putting into my body I would go into like the Berkeley student food collective which was like crunchy Mm -hmm. grocery store and like (laughs) look at all the labels and and be not interested from like a restriction point of view but like what am I actually putting into my body and what is making me feel good so when I started developing my own recipes, all I really wanted to do was pare everything down to as minimal ingredients as I could get it. So, you know, that meant swapping an all-purpose for like an almond flour or using coconut oil instead of butter. And by default of me using these ingredients, it just happened to be vegan. It happened to be gluten-free, which, you know, for me, like you said, it wasn't my intention, but it made it cool for me to have this inclusive sort of aspect to my work, which means that more people can enjoy my recipes. I legit buy that. I think that some may say that it was organic and maybe they it wasn't so organic but I legit buy that from you because it clearly is the way you work and you you really just are you true to yourself and you're not trying to position it as some kind of trend yeah but let's go back to Berkeley because yeah. I feel like that's a cool <laughs> thread because you know Berkeley really is um, the the heart of the natural food movement in America you're at school there are you cheese board pizza hive <laughs> Of course, I had to be <laughs> until I like kind of stopped eating dairy. I was exactly. like, let me enjoy this while I can. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you're right. It was such a hub for interesting, diverse, yeah. um, creative, inventive, and also like whole food cooking. Yeah. I mean, to talk about Chez Panisse, right? Like that it was such um, a mm-hmm. cool thing to be like in that orbit in some way. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like I was like at Chez Panisse every day. <laughs> Let me be clear. Yeah, like I yeah. forced my parents to come take me there for nice. my birthday. Like that was the vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really inspiring to be in such a cool space for school and, and kind of connected to food down the line. You write about your upbringing in Southern California and you write about not being Indian enough and not being American enough. I love that way of framing and just can you expand on that for for our listeners? What does that mean and how did that inform the way you write your recipes and cook? Of course. I mean, I think it's a really common immigrant kid experience, right? Like I knew at home that I was Indian. I saw the food that was on my table every day that my mom would cook and that was undoubtedly Indian. But then I would go to school and there were basically no people that looked like me. I never had any Indian friends. I lived in a predominantly white community. So, um, you know, not to say that I wasn't Mm -hmm. privileged to grow up where I did, but um, in terms of that cultural aspect, I really didn't feel like I belonged um, in school or in my groups of friends because I had Mm -hmm. a very different experience at home. But I'm so grateful for that because it's what gave me that culture. It's what gave me that love for food. I think if anyone is Indian or knows Indian food, you know how important it is to our culture and just being Indian. So I wanted to weave that into the book and that experience into the book as much as possible because I didn't see a lot of people talking about that when I was growing up. And had I had someone, you know, in media or in the food space or any space say like, it's cool that like you're kind of straddling this line of of not feeling like you belong here or there. um, That's normal. And and you just got to embrace it. I think Soleil Ho coined the phrase in the pages of taste assimilation food. Mm. 
Uh, do you do you have you heard of that term? Is that yeah. something that you you subscribe to? You know, in some ways, I think for me, I like to use what I saw growing up as inspiration as well to make it my own. So while some of my my curries or my dishes aren't exactly like how my mom makes it, I am inspired by the way that she uses mm-hmm. food and the way that she has kind of taken what she saw her mom cook growing up and bring it into my sister in my lives. Um, It's interesting because I always did see her do similar things that I do in terms of swapping, you know, heavy cream for like a light yogurt or a tomato sauce or something that was a little bit different to make it her own. And by default, I know a lot of people have this kind of Indian food gets this rap of being like really heavy and like you're rolling yourself home because of the ghee after your meal. But it is very light. It's very plant forward. And um, that was kind of cool to see and take into my own cooking. I have some questions about growing up and your cooking, but you I first have to land on um, a recipe that you call the best doll ever. <laughs> I feel that's fighting words. I feel Priya <laughs> Krishna in her book, Friend of Taste, uh, has written uh, a recipe called the best doll ever or something of that of that ilk. Mm-hmm. So why is yours the best doll ever? Like, th- Sama, this is fighting time. Yeah, I know, Matt. I mean, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, but no, this was, I think, one of the first Indian recipes that I developed kind of on my own. And it's kind of interesting because it takes some coconut milk in there to make it really creamy, which is a little little like surprising for yeah. a doll um, you see you know your cream or your butter in a doll makhni but not really in a traditional yellow lentil so I think it is the best doll ever not just because it has these unique ingredients but also I sneak some sneaky spinach in there yeah, which right we love vegetables I personally do not have kids but mm-hmm. I hear mm-hmm. that hiding vegetables is a thing <laughs> so I also find that it's resonated really well with my audience it, it is a thing I, I recall a cookbook from maybe a decade ago where they were talking about like like forcing broccoli into a pastry. <laughs> so sad. It's so sad. I think doing it your way is better. <laughs> Thank you. It wilts to nothing. It's like it you wilts. don't even know what's in there. I love that. So <laughs> what did you what did you eat growing up? Let's hear some of the uh, some of the dishes that you really remember and love from your childhood. Yeah, I mean, dal for sure. While we're on that topic, a lot of dal. I had a lot of green beans. I had a lot of karai chicken. So I ate meat growing up yeah. as well. Um, and that was something that was on my table a lot. Um, we have sukha goch, which is sort of like a... A delicious soft um, like meat dish which is mm-hmm. also amazing um, lots of different vegetables and lots of different curries and my mm-hmm. mom <laughs> it's funny the way she cooks is she will make something that she made like a few days ago and be like that's weird this didn't turn out like it turned out last <laughs> time but it's still good and I love that kind of spirit around cooking where you just keep iterating and changing yeah. until you surprise yourself and and it's kind of cool to just be you know, not stick to every, anything per se and just kind of yeah. experiment along the way. It's so smartly, what wisely said, I, I think it's experimentation is is really the uh, the way we get to these recipes um, that go viral, yeah. so to speak. Um, it's all about uh, experimentation and, and, and learning from failure, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, I want to hear about some of the, I mean, some of the book, the book is filled with non-Indian dishes. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it runs the gamut, but... You have something called the chocolate chip cookie pie. <laughs> what is up with that? That sounds really good. What is not up with that, Matt, is what I have to say. <laughs> you totally. Know, you, <laughs> you take a regular chocolate chip cookie, right? And I was like, this is great. But <laughs> what if we made it bigger and made it into this dense, delicious, almost cakey pie? Um, this is one of the first recipes that I developed and one of the first ones that my like mom fell in love with. And my mom... like. She eats sugar, like she eats regular sugar. She eats butter, she eats flour, she eats all of the things. So the chocolate chip cookie pie is sort of my like gateway recipe for people who are curious about, you know, baking with almond flour or not using an egg in something. Um, And it is so delicious on its own. I don't even like, I don't even slice it. I eat it with a spoon and ice cream. Um, So there's a lot of things up with that for (laughs) sure. (laughs) You're right. And you bake with avocado and I think... To me, <laughs> that seems impossible. <laughs> like I, I feel like I've had like avocado pudding before, mm-hmm. and it's been nice. And like I'm not, I'm not going to bet. Nice. <laughs> it's been nice. It's been nice. But like, let's hear about baking with avocado because I, I want you just to wa- like walk us through how that works. Controversial for sure. Totally. And I love that for me because yeah. kind of what I do um, is put kind of random ingredients or things you don't expect to be there in recipes. And that was actually my first today segment. I had mm-hmm. oh. a chickpea uh, brownie or chickpea blonde excuse me and also a tahini brownie and the anchors had to guess what secret ingredient was in the (laughs) baked goods um so that's kind of my vibe but not in a way where you'll be like 
you'll really taste the avocado or you'll really taste the chickpea. It's kind of how can I use these ingredients in ways that are surprising? Yeah. Um, with avocado, it is so creamy. It is so rich. It's such a great source of fat that you can add that into a brownie like I do in my book for my avocado brownies. And it acts as sort of like a butter or an oil mm-hmm. replacement. And you don't taste the avocado at all because it is pretty neutral. And when you're adding something like cocoa powder, you're adding your maple syrup or your coconut sugar, you're masking that flavor, but not in a way where you're like trying to it just is there to kind of serve as that nice replacement um i also always find that i buy a bunch of avocados and they all ripen at the same time i know that's the worst and like the guacamole worst. only goes so far like you definitely exactly. like you know want guacamole one night a week but not three nights a week not at least for nights. my family yeah agree and so i'm just like sitting over here like okay i've got three avocados when you've exhausted all the savory uses <laughs> you can make these avocado brownies I'm actually going to correct the record. I just rethought that in the moment. I was like, I would eat guacamole three days a week for real. Like, sorry, that was like actually really untrue. That was unfair. That was unfair for the guacamole board. Uh, I mean, so do you do you have a guacamole go to? Do you do you have a way of doing guacamole? It's really just standard. I do add some cumin in there for fun. (sighs) Stop. Do you? Never done it. Oh, I mean, <laughs> like, I, that seemed like a, a really like familiar like gasp. <laughs> it was the gasp of the opposite. But let's 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 go there. Cumin and avocado. I love or guacamole. Let's go there. I love cumin and everything. Like it is <laughs> yeah. something that I put I put it in my hummus. I put it yeah. in all of my Indian dishes. It's very standard. It's very like a staple spice for yeah. me. I would say like in any of my Indian cooking, it's the turmeric, the cayenne, the cumin, like always make an appearance. But I just love it's almost like this like earthy kick it adds to everything mm. and with guac i keep it pretty basic but that's like the one little fun thing i do have a friend who adds tahini to their her guacamole which is also pretty interesting might get you well. kicked out of mexico you might like absolutely just like exported yeah, you or might imported from mexico yeah. you might i'm just saying i use cumin <laughs> <laughs> cumin is totally cool i i think tahini and guacamole is cool um it's definitely non-traditional no but. I'm into cumin as well. I feel like it's it's it definitely spans the world essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, we this is off book a little bit because I I, I sent you some questions, but like tell me like the idea of curry powder. I want to mm-hmm. like as, as much as possible talk about this topic because mm-hmm. it's so misunderstood. Marijuana Rani was on the podcast. I would say in the 30s Love or 40s, uh, 45 maybe around there. Go back to that and hear him talk, say a lot about it. But for you. What is the issue with curry powder and 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 kind of some misperceptions, conceptions about curry powder? Sure. Well, curry powder is not a thing. Like, it's not a thing in Thank Indian you. food. Um, Thank it you. Is, it doesn't exist. Thank you. However, I think that if you are kind of intimidated by Indian cooking, this is what I try and sort of um, share in my book, is that if you're intimidated by Indian cooking, start with a cumin cayenne turmeric and work with that experiment and that's what's going to get you a really delicious result with those Indian spices. Mm -hmm. I also feel bad in saying that like never use curry powder again because if it is an accessible thing for people Mm -hmm. and they, you know, you know, don't have access or they can't afford a billion spices in their cupboard and can get this one curry powder and that's all they have to make a delicious Mm -hmm. Indian inspired meal. Great. Go for it. But, you know, for the record, it's not like a thing in the Indian world or diaspora. Yeah, and and it's definitely one of those 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 spice blends that gets like muddied through like the game of telephone mm-hmm. that is food media and, and social 100%. media. Um, so articulating that way is helpful. Um, how do you buy your spices? Do you buy them whole and roast and grind, or do you <laughs> do you just go like straight McCormick? Oh my gosh, I love a lot of different spice. I love um, spice walla. I love diaspora, so I yeah. try and buy my spices from those two kind of mm-hmm. sources because I know how much time and care they take in sourcing the spices, and that's all I really care about. It care about. I'm going to be honest. I do not buy my spices whole and yeah. grind them and roast them and grind them um, because, you know, sometimes time. time is a thing. Um, but I think when you can look at where everything is coming from and trace that back and feel confident about where, you know, where you're sourcing it from, that's kind of the most important thing I look for. In a past interview, I think it was with Carrie Diamond on Cherry Bomb. I love that. Oh, that was great. I love her. Go yes. go tune into that one too. Great Thank podcast. You. But let's uh, let's 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 talk about hummus because you, you <laughs> said there's a lot of noise out there with hummus. There's a lot of noise, and I think <laughs> you're right. So what does that mean? And also, like, what? How did you land on your hummus recipe? Yeah. Um, I just want to be really clear. I'm obsessed with hummus. Yeah. I will. I gravitate towards hummus anywhere I go. If like Target was selling hummus, I'd probably buy it just to try it and see what was up. 
Um, that being said, like it is something that I feel very passionate about and I have had so many like different variations over the years that I almost felt scared to create my own because yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, this has got to be good. Um, but like I said, I use really just all of the traditional elements in maybe different ratios that other people or other chefs might. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I add cumin, I do a hummus that has um, kind of like a pesto vibe to it. So you've got yes. that like basil in there, you've got some olive oil, um, I even add some sneaky spinach in there, I guess like. <laughs> I like I'm really yeah. great for parents who need to hide vegetables for their yeah. kids. Um, and for me, my my tip and my secret with making a really good hummus is blending it really long. Like, so you want to blend it like three or four times so you get that really mm-hmm. extra velvety smooth texture. So blend, and olive oil, blend, olive oil, blend. So, you know, it's like you have all of, all of your ingredients in there and you're blending it and you kind of get to this nice smooth consistency. Once you get it smooth, like you're not done. Like blend it again, <laughs> like three to four right. times because it's going to get super, super smooth. And, and that's kind of what I look for. I'm not hating against a chunky hummus. Like no. feel free. Yeah. But, um. I love that velvety smooth. You texture. gotta go long. Yeah. I, and, and FYI, they do sell hummus at Target. Do they? They do, and I've uh, absolutely it buy it often. Great. So here's okay. Here's my little take on hummus. I'll say this real quickly. So there's hummus that you get in like a shuk, or you get in Israel, mm-hmm. or you get in Lebanon, or you get you know somewhere or in a restaurant yeah. with a lot of great uh, sourcing. Um, and then you get something called like Sabra or you get something <laughs> that's called a brand like Sabra. Something called Sabra. And that's not hummus. That's a separate food item. But mm-hmm. I actually, I really like yeah. that food item. Yeah. I like the, it, like the tart. I like the citric acid in it. I like the way you can spoon it on a disc and it feels like it sticks there. Yes. I, I don't know. Like for me, hummus can be really traditional with great tahini, like sum tahini. Mm-hmm. And then it can be that industrial stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, Trader Joe's makes some pretty good hummus. Like I'm not mad at their spicy avocado hummus. Yo, definitely not. I'm not mad at it. And again, it. like accessibility is really important. And I feel like if you don't have the time or energy or funds to like go out and get make your own hummus at home. Although I will say making your hummus at home is like pretty inexpensive. And like, I mean, if you have like a nice quality tahini, of course, that's maybe more mm-hmm. of an investment. But you you can really make that last but chickpeas what it's like 79 cents for a can of chickpeas. you're using cans right yeah i'm using a can and i know yeah. that's controversial and i know a lot of people would say sama like that's not traditional cook uh-huh. it from dry like let it whatever so yeah. all of the things but um i can get a good result from a canned chickpea and i also then have like 20 more hours of my day 100 percent agree i'm hard disagree on only dry chickpeas and yeah. hummus i think salamanov has a really good canned chickpea recipe yeah. for hummus he does yeah shout to the canned chickpea i love it yeah um, we love it t- let's talk about the last recipe that you just improvised to perfection mm. i bake a lot that's something that i like to do even when i'm stressed i stress bake like it's a nice therapy thing for me i made a pumpkin funfetti cake um last week that i didn't know what i was doing going into it i was like we'll just see what happens Mm -hmm. i had a little cute bottle of sprinkles in my pantry (laughs) which i never have i don't even know where it came from to be honest so i'm sorry to anyone who ate that um it was my like mom um (laughs) And I made this really delicious funfetti pumpkin cake. And I know this also is controversial. I don't know why I'm sparking so much controversy today, but... Lots of it on the Taste Podcast, mm, always controversial. Lots of it. Um, Pumpkin is not my favorite thing. Like, I develop pumpkin recipes for my loved ones and my community because I know they love it. But I would prefer pretty much anything else. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But a pumpkin funfetti cake, it was mild enough to where, like, you could still kind of taste the pumpkin. It was, like, a nice sweetness, but it Mm -hmm. wasn't like really overpowering. I, uh, in terms of gourds, I think pumpkins uh, in the, or in the gourd squash realm, pumpkins are pretty low. I think realm. once it hits like November one, like, I mean, pumpkin pie, I guess Thanksgiving, but pumpkin's pretty gross. So, oh, you don't like it either? No, I'm not. Oh it's, my God. I've never met anyone like you. <laughs> Yo, I, I, I think there's definitely secret pumpkin haters out there. They are, but they're not showing themselves. It was brave <laughs> for me to even say what I said. <laughs> it was brave. It's not controversial, but I do think that improvising a, a pumpkin f- funfetti cake it's pretty rad. Thank you. Rad. Was there an icing on it? Yeah, but I bought that from the store. And I'll admit to that. Yo, so what's a what's a like plant-based uh, uh, frosting that you use? Um, I got a Simple Mills frosting, which is oh. actually delicious. And they use like kind of similar vibe ingredients that I use already. And it's pretty good. So I have to say, I was like, I don't have my powdered sugar on me. I'm just going <laughs> to gonna really just be lazy and that's okay. It's it's the only way to do it sometimes. I know. So we ask all guests on the Taste Podcast, if you could write a cookbook without time or budget mm. or any of those constraints that come into the, the process of writing a book, 
what would that book be? I want to know your answer. Um, so I'm going to ask you that after I answer. Okay. Um, I would probably spend some time in India and maybe trace my family history and recipes if I can somehow find it and kind of take, I guess, a, a combination of those recipes and maybe mix it with like Ayurvedic food. Yeah. And, and I'm super interested in kind of the entire like school of Ayurveda because I think maybe in my next book I might explore that a little bit Um, but I think that would be really interesting because I incorporate some I guess practices of Ayurvedic living into my life and I think it really aligns with a plant-based lifestyle but it's also not restrictive it's also very um, it's really all for feeling good and and working with what your body needs so I think that would be an interesting thing to to do. Give us one example of an Ayurvedic technique or, or 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 concept that we can all apply to our lives yeah i talk about this on my my instagram a lot too every single morning before i do anything i have a glass of warm water so that is like the first thing i do before my coffee for my probiotic anything that i take um and it's really good for your digestion and it also is said to like help like age your metabolism not like i i'm not the person to say like it speeds it up or do anything like that um, but it is such a nice and like grounding ritual for the day and gets you like hydrated straight off the bat. Mm-hmm. Um, warm because cold water like shocks your digestive system. Yeah. So I don't drink cold water at all. It's either room temp or warm for me. So that's one thing that I learned um, that has really, really helped my existence. Did that take some discipline? Like an, an ice cold glass of water is not in your reality. It's not. I literally, I literally <laughs> like go to a restaurant and say, can I just get this without ice? <laughs> like I don't, I don't want it. It's, yeah. but I feel a Respect difference them. though. Like I, I really yeah. do. I, I feel better when it's something a little more warm and comforting. I'm gonna try that. I like. I'm gonna do a week without cold water. I like that. I like. I want to see how it actually affects. Yeah. Will you let me know? Yeah. I and will. can you also answer that last question? You went back to it. You're a great. <laughs> I remembered. <laughs> Where's your podcast? Let's I know, sign right? Up to it. Um, it's a good. I've never been asked. I've done a few hundred interviews in this room. So thank you for doing that. Mm. I guess my my book. I've been talking to Dan Holzman, who I wrote a book called Food IQ that's coming about out next year. So excited. Thank you. I. This is not meant to hype any of that, but like. I'm hyping though. <laughs> I think honestly, <laughs> we we have this um, shared history of we're both Jews and we our, our families immigrated from different parts of Europe. Mm. Um, he from Russia, mine from Poland, and also parts of uh, the Ukraine. Um, so I think doing a book where we we actually just dis- rediscovered our roots, our Jew- Jewish roots, a little mm. bit, um, but also thought about uh, Jewish food in a in a way uh, like two guys, um, one from New York, one from the Midwest, doing um, riffing on like what Jewish food means. I think that would be I fun. I think it would be great. It's like self-indulgent. Like I asked you, you know, it's cool. I think it's on the horizon then. Thanks, Sama, for asking. <laughs> How did the first IRL go for you? This was so fun. Honestly, I love this. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Heasel. The show is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.